Uh, our, our final treat uh, for the afternoon and for this meeting uh, is a meeting with Twyla Tharp, uh, who needs no introduction, so I'm going to be really brief. Uh, she started her dance company, Twyla Tharp Dance, in 1965, two years after graduating from Barnard, and her journey to New York, uh, which she uh, <clears throat> outlined in her very engaging memoir that came out a number of years ago. Uh, she's choreographed more than 160 works uh, for dances, television specials, Hollywood movies, four full-length ballets, four Broadway shows, <clears throat> two figure skating routines. Uh, she's choreographed not only for her own company, but for really almost any company you can name. Uh, her work expands the boundaries of ballet and modern dance. Uh, she, her work first appeared on Broadway in 1980. She's collaborated with many musicians, many others. Uh, she's the winner of a MacArthur Fellowship, a uh, member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, an honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and she was elected to the APS in 2015. I'll just say as a personal note, it's a uh, thrill for me to welcome her. Um, I've been a, a dance fan for many years, and I can't remember how many years ago it was that I saw my first Twyla Tharp dance, which was in the upper room with music by Philip Glass, and it just blew me away. And I thought, who created this? Where has this been all my life? Many years ago. Uh, so it's a great pleasure um, to turn the sta virtual stage over to you. Thank you so much for the very, very kind words. And above all, I'm very happy to be a treat. I hope that will continue to be your feeling. It's a great honor to be invited to speak to the society and to be um, invited to be a member. I appreciate it very much. Um, and I would like to begin by saying how wonderful it is to hear intelligent remarks and to say that I feel I am the defender in a way of the larger container of the instrument that we address in the society. Uh, the body at large is something we tend to take for granted and we know better, but I'm here to nudge. So uh, for any 71 year old gentlemen who are wondering how to avoid COVID, I would like to suggest that a healthy immune system will better do the job if it's in exercise. We are never ever too old to exercise nor too burdened with thought to exercise. Uh, of course, I could not help but note uh, the very well-known fact that the Socratic philosophers thought in motion, that Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, all participated in gymnasia and that their lectures were given in these locations and that this connection between the thinking mind and the working body has been lost to a great degree in our culture and needs to be re-implemented. It also holds many keys to societal resolutions. We dance together, we are together. We have two legs, we have two arms, that's it, let's go. So that having all been said, uh, I would like to um, begin by saying this book is the basis, it's here, it will still be here for Christmas gifts, uh, called Keep It Moving. It's going into paperback now very soon. Uh, lessons for the rest of your life. And it is exercises in movement that is accessible to everyone uh, as they mature uh, and also as they do not feel themselves to be dancers, which few of us really consist of in any kind of sophisticated degree, but any of us who get up every day is in fact practicing. So having said that, I, um, in lecturing, try to get as rapidly as possible 
to what interests me much more than these remarks. And I suspect often in my audience interest, interests the audience more as well, which is the listeners remarks and questions. So just to sort of uh, prime the pump, uh, I will introduce the chapters. The first is called Terms and Conditions. And this is yes, taken as a contract and is a simple statement that once you commit to living inside your body, you need to do it as well as you possibly can, that this is a daily practice and that you will be practicing it. Uh, as you move along in your life, what you can practice changes. I like to, in fact, I'm happy to say a lot of dancers were very pleased with this book and they read it immediately and took to the story that, oh my God, I've only got like 12 years to dance and then what's gonna happen to me? Because that is unfortunately in a professional dancer's life, uh, always a possibility. And to them, I say, guys, get busy, start storing it up in advance, start your bank account now and start formulating your foundation for when you are 40, when you are 50, when you are 60, when you are 70, when you are, oh my God, 80, 90. Your life will change, your body will change, but your commitment to maintaining your physical vehicle to the very best of your possibilities uh, will always be um, a responsibility. The second chapter is called The Life We Choose. Again, it's a question of taking responsibility. You could say that uh, this responsibility that I'm describing um, is descended upon you. Not really. You can choose to disregard it. Many of us do. Um, and we wonder why we are perhaps not thinking as well as we once did, or why we're maybe not enjoying something quite as much, or what happened to the passion. And the uh, response that I always give is, well, that's what you chose to do. Change it, change your choice. Make certain the first thing you do every day is to acknowledge what your body is today, and to refreshen your commitment to keep your connection to your body as strong as it can possibly be. Uh, chapter three just says it another way, body is your job. Yes, your body needs to be your primary job or your secondary job will not be very successful. Uh, we tend to say we have only so much time in the day, this is true. Uh, but we can always make a tiny bit more if we really think we can make a difference, you can make a difference. Uh, and the body is your primary job. If you do not respect and honor and pay your body its due sustenance, you're shortchanging your life. These are all words. They're not actions. That's what I usually do. So that seated here, I'm going, Oh, words, and to some degree that's true, but I hope that they are having some settling effect, some what we call grounding, so that at least you'll be guilty. Uh, next, make change your habit. Your body is going to change. You have to change with it. Uh, you can begin as a young person doing absolutely everything with uh, no care, certainly jump, run, turn, it's all right there. Um, as we go along, the body is gonna change. So I went from ballet class to uh, weight training, to boxing, uh, to running, to expanding the vocabulary that I could no longer so easily implement. You have to be reasonable with your body, let it do what it can do. Let it do it well and try to expand what that is. Don't frustrate yourself doing what you have always done because your body is not the same as it always was. We know this, but we don't really feel it. We don't really believe it. That's where uh, all of this uh, verbiage uh, needs to settle in. And the uh, fifth chapter is called Kick It In The High Gear. This one's harder as you go along. Uh, the older you get, the more difficult it is to uh, implement 
you're exercising with real zest to really take on the challenge of beating the goals to set a new record. Um, and this is true. The margins decrease the older the body gets, but it does not mean that you can't still push the envelope gently, very gently. Uh, we have then a chapter six called Hope Less, Plan More, which simply means what it says. I'm a great believer in schedules. Schedule your activity. Do it regularly. And as I suggested, first thing in the morning is always the best. Late at night is difficult for a number of reasons. If it's all that you have, it's better than nothing. Switch your hours around, make it first in the morning. Uh, the uh, long haul is chapter seven. The long haul is what it says. It's about stamina. Stamina is your best friend. As we age, our reservoirs of uh, stayability, being able to stay focused in a room, stay focused on a page, stay focused, will want to decrease. And we have to consciously work on our stamina in exactly the same way that physically we have to constantly maintain the numbers and try to drive them a little higher because if you're not lifting the bar, you're lowering the bar. It doesn't just sit. The uh, next chapter is called Bounce Back After Stamina. Resiliency is your best friend. Uh, that the body has flexibility so that the, all of the mechanisms which are being so beautifully studied, uh, all of the cellular constructs, all the neurons, all of these entities can continue in their pathway because if you don't stretch and maintain the flexibility of your body, you're throwing up a lot of detours. Uh, and a lot of passages close off. The next chapter is called The Swap. In this one, I attempt to allow for the aging body to have a little more self-respect than sometimes it can feel like it is receiving. Uh, because what you begin to find is that you have gravitas. Gravitas is a wonderful word that means people will believe you. That's a responsibility. They will also believe how you behave. That also is a responsibility. If you have children, you have grandchildren, you have friends, uh, you want them to sense that this commitment that you have made long ago and that you maintain on a daily basis gives you a presence that they can respect. Uh, the next chapter is called Build a Second Act. This is, this is an easy one. It means simply if you have a past, you have a present, and your present can enfold that past and create a future. All along the way, I'm skipping all the fun anecdotes that make this book a really good Christmas present, uh, such as Rodin, who had the experience of early in his career uh, having done a set of legs that were to be a walking figure, but then put it in the corner of his studio and many, many years later, 30 years later, 40 years later, going back to it, looking at it and seeing a torso over here he hadn't also used, put it on top, their scale was totally wrong. He called it The Walking Man, it's a great work of art. How could he do that? Because he had gravitas, because he believed what he had done had value, it had a different kind of value when he looked at it from a different perspective. He put the two values together, voila, one value. So we always can take another um, look at, at what we have learned. Obviously the body gives us problems. My body remembers a lot of stuff that's learned that it can't just whip out and show you, which is really too bad. However, at the same time, the fact that it has buried in it all of this residue of movement has made it possible for me to work on Zoom to great effect. I've done four projects with dancers globally in not only different locations in different time zones, but with very different trainings. So that uh, in Russia, it's the Mariansky, uh, it's the Vaganova. In Denmark, it's the Bornenville. 
Uh, here in New York, we were working with Cicchetti based techniques and I could bring these all together, but only because I thought, well, why not? And because my body said, I remember sort of how that felt. I'll bet that feels the same over there in Russia. So it allowed me also to believe uh, that we could join physically if we could connect mentally and we could and vice versa, simply because every day we commit to our bodies and we believe that we can do what we set out to do. This kind of positivism comes from respecting your body. The uh, 11th chapter is stronger for the mending. This is the unfun one where you recover from your surgery and you spend the year in PT and then you go, oh, I am so much stronger than I ever was. That's not quite true. You probably will never be as strong as you ever were before the surgery, but you will have a different kind of strength after the surgery. You will have a profound gratitude to your body for its ability to adjust and to accept new information and to show you new ways to go. So from that point of view, you have new resources and you are stronger. The last chapter is called Shut Up and Dance. It's of course what we dancers basically do because we express the intellect, the faith, the belief in justice, righteousness, all of these qualities that we so value physically, non-linguistically. And the anecdote that I leave the book with is uh, that Shakespeare in closing his plays uh, would finish the last monologue, the last dialogue, audience applauds. Meanwhile, the band is warming up and the players are all changing into their clothes and they come on stage and they dance. They're through speaking, they move, and they move to release the audience from its head trip, if you will, from having imported itself up onto stage and becoming virtual players in Shakespeare's world. Shakespeare had the graciousness and the generosity to give them themselves back by saying, no, here we go, we all dance, you're in your body, we're in our bodies, let's go everybody dance, and oh, by the way, there's the exit. So that is uh, the purpose of this book. And uh, again, I am um, deeply pleased, honored and moved to be in your society and in your, and in your group to share these things and to learn from you and to give back to you. What you already know, I'm just here to remind you. Now, do we have any questions? Okay, let, let me start and let me invite questions in the, uh, the Q&A function. Uh, you know, obviously these uh, 10, 11, 12 principles didn't come to you overnight. No. They're the product of a lifetime of learning by experience. And I'd be interested in hearing you talk a bit about your own transition points. So a point at which <clears throat> I assume maybe a, a rather drawn out period in which you transition from being <clears throat> a performer yourself on stage to creating dance and working with other people as a, with your dancers in your company as a, as a mentor and, and, and teacher. And was that a, was that a hard shift or just terrible terrible there's nothing so much fun as dancing really well there never will be it was terrible yes thank you for the question um uh, first of all the first time i did not dance in one of my own pieces was uh in 1969 a big piece in central park that had 66 players in acres of activity and I could tell that I couldn't be inside and outside at the same point. So there I said, okay, 
I'll give it up for you guys and for learning. I'll go outside and I'll learn. What can I see here that I couldn't do from the inside? That was a very, very big lesson, obviously. I went back into the group. I danced more on occasion, but the group grew and the responsibilities of maintaining the group grew. Uh, the fundraising, the administration, the all of the issues with promotion, everything that it is to be a performing entity uh, became uh, the bigger service than my own performance. Uh, and I took that on. Uh, then uh, there were other commissions, uh, commercial projects. And then suddenly you find, oh, now I'll go back center stage and you go, oh dear, it's a bit late, just a little bit. So now then how better can we uh, help people see what it is to move, which after all is what a dance does. It, it shares what the body can accomplish in time and space in service of our culture, in service of our values, in service of our better selves. Uh, and how can, I, how can I help the audience to perceive these things? One, I can become a better choreographer. I can become more focused. Uh, I can use my materials better, but two, I can learn to speak, and three, I can learn to write. Learning to speak was something I did consciously. I went to monologue class. As a dancer, you do not speak. I was a very silent child, and many dancers have uh, do not consider language to be their, their uh, primary communication. Obviously, it's not. So when uh, I made this realization that in order to reach people, I would need to study how one speaks, I did become uh, an actor uh, briefly uh, and studied uh, in, in terms of uh, scene work and uh, monologues, dialogues. Uh, and that helped me to project and to receive information from an audience linguistically that otherwise uh, was not a possibility for me at all. Um, so learning to write, I've always been a little intrigued by writing. I graduated from Barnard, but I spent three semesters at Pomona uh, and uh, my, uh, my counselor there was a Milton scholar. So of course it language had some attraction uh, and I was I'm very grateful for those exposures. But anyone who writes knows full well how unbelievably lonely it is. Uh, and I, I found that that burden was one that I really couldn't quite take on. Um, it is, uh, it is, it is, it, it's the most, writing is the most difficult thing I have ever tried to do. It may be simply that I don't have the chops, I don't have the skills, but I think really more it's because you have to be everything yourself as a writer. As a choreographer, you have dancers, you have audience, you have uh, a correspondence even while you're working that you don't as a writer. So those were skills that I set about practicing in order to remove myself from the physical body that no longer could do what it once could and yet feel I was in service. This is, excuse me, this is a question that you've kind of addressed um, in, in your own way, but here it is as a direct question. It strikes me that words can be a way of the brain dancing and that may not be so different than the body actually dancing. You would thought. Well, I think that's very generous of you. <laughs> yes. Uh, here's the thing. When I did uh, the show Moving Out with Billy Joel, we opened in Chicago. We were a disaster in Chicago. We got trumped and we took all the trumpage to task and um, isolated lessons and brought it in as a massive hit in New York. But part of the trumpage was confusion. And our lighting designer, a wonderful designer, some of you may know, Jennifer Tipton, uh, was seated next to an audience person who was watching the first act like this. <laughs> Etc. So Jenny asked her in intermission, you don't like the show? She said, I do like the show, I do. I just don't know how to get my information. In other words, she was finding it really difficult to process the language of Billy's songs, the music of the band, 
and the movement that was telling a different story than what the language was. The brain could clearly see that the story being told in movement was not what the words were saying. The processing was warped. We are a very stratified uh, system a very stratified learning system. One thing that I'm very concerned with and hope that I will be able to make a dent in before it is no longer possible um, is how dance is registered for the future. Uh, how is it documented? How is it archived best? And the system that we're currently working with locks the visual with the musical and the text so that all three streams of information are placed in conjunct. Uh, so yes, uh, it's complicated. <clears throat> Another question <clears throat> here from Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot. Your talk stress serious themes of maturity, resilience, stamina, gravitas. As I have watched your dance and choreography over the years, I've been impressed with the play. Can you talk a little about the role of play, its creative and expressive potential in your work? Uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the what word? The play? P-L-A-Y, play. -L -A -Y, play. Uh, the play, yeah, play is important. Uh, in fact, uh, if, if there's a groove, if you get in the groove where you're having a good time and yay verily something might even be funny, you're safe. You will make no mistakes. Nothing goes wrong there. So the gear of play, which is a sort of freedom, uh, is really, really a wonderful place to be. It means you're not thinking about being judged. And in a way, you're not thinking about the consequences because you're so comfortable being where you are. You couldn't imagine anything could go wrong. So yeah, play is a really good thing. Here's a question. <clears throat> Can you comment on the role of music in the lifelong practices of keeping the body moving. Do you, you, do you use music in your own daily practice of movement? Your choreography has such musical range. Do you now have preferences? Right, music is something that I grew up with. My mother was a concert pianist. Uh, she started her children on ear training before we were a year old. I was at a uh, piano uh, professional teacher when I was two years old. I have perfect pitch so that I learn by color, not by reading the notes, but by color. So when I hear a D, I see red, a G is purple. I grew up playing a small violin. I grew up playing a viola. Uh, I grew up playing in quartets. I grew up listening to music. I grew up working in a drive-in theater and hearing Warner Brothers cartoons and all the film scores for about 15 years. So all of this stuff mushes and morphs and Elvis Presley was definitely the sexiest thing ever, right? Heartbreak Hotel. I mean, what can I tell you? All right. So you got all this stuff and it's like composting in here and music is tangible life. Uh, when I work with a composer's music, for example, Beethoven. I worked, I've done a number of Beethoven's. I've worked with a lot of his music, the Diabelli. In order to approach the Diabelli, I learned the Diabelli. I read Beethoven, I read what letters there were, and I thought about the purpose in his head of doing this. I also studied how he wrote music, which was in part, in a series of notebooks. He had them in three sizes. He had the small one he walked with daily and would make notes as he was walking, ambulatory thinking. Secondly, he would transpose those notes into a different, more holdable format. And thirdly, when he returned to something, it could be decades later, which in the case of the Diabelli, it was, he would completely redraft into new scores so that he was always progressing his thinking but containing it in these vehicles. Uh, I think a lot about how material matures um, so that studying the Beethoven progression of a single motif, ba 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 yomp, did not start out. Ba 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 yomp, it started out ba, buddy, balk. And he didn't like that. And he worked on it for about eight years. And then it got to be bada, 
but um, not quite yet, another 12 years. I'm exaggerating slightly, but not a lot. If you love something, you keep at it until you believe that it really is what it is meant to be. Um, and I've learned this from artists. Uh, I've learned it certainly from composers, from Bach, from Beethoven, from Mozart, from you know Haydn. Uh, and it, it, you, you feel, particularly when you have access to the working materials, like with the Beethoven repository, uh, you feel that ongoing plodding, if you will, that reluctance to give up the bone until it's really exactly what it can be. So yeah, music I listen to a lot. I think about it a lot. Uh, I'm very grateful for composers. They're some of my very best friends. Well, <clears throat> I think that's probably a good place for us to wrap up because those are... Thank yeah. you and thank you all. And again, my, my, my gratitude for your companionship uh, and for the offer of membership in the Philosophical Society. Thank you. I hope you'll come back uh, when we all meet in person and you don't have to sing for your supper. You can just sit and listen. I hope so. I look forward. Thank I you. And I want to thank everybody for uh, being with us these last two and a half days. And um, I wish I could say we'll all see each other in April. I think that's probably not the case, but at least virtually it will be. And um, so be well, everybody. Thanks very much. Thank you.